All right. Dr. Bradley, I think we're ready. All right. Can you say to be up on the phone? A little closer. Can you hear me up the end of the phone? If someone can say yes, I would appreciate it. Okay, try now. All right, can you guys see me on the phone? It's a little difficult to hear you, Dr. Bradley. Can you get closer? I'm sure there's only so close I do that. I may be using the mic on my computer. Uh, it's a very background. I hear you in the very background. I don't hear you very well. We're going to go on and call me to order. It is 904. Hopefully, we only have time here right now to see Jeff Bradley. I uh, want to thank everyone for joining us in a hybrid virtual and in person format today. And I shall be going to go ahead and roll call, please. And who's saying? Yeah, we're having a, a very hard time hearing you. Maybe if there's a cell phone in the room calling into the meeting and passing that phone around when whoever's talking might might be a better option. Yeah, all right, I we're agree. pushing buttons so left and right, so it's awfully hard to hear. Yeah, I can't I can't hear it all. I can't hear it all either. Shelly. I'm going to try this for an audio check. Much better. All right, we're going to try this for an audio check, and then I'll go on mute and then see if Shelly can use one of the computers to do audio. I'll try roll call with Andrew Tang. Present. I'll try and roll call with Andrew Tang. Present. Tony Griffin. Brent Burgett. Present. Chris DeChan. Chris Dalvino. Cliff Jones. Present. Uh -huh. <laughs> David Nachuka. Hi, uh, David Nachuka. Debbie Johnson. Present. Bronco Castro Moran. Present. Neil Bradley, present. Garth Gamer. Herman Butler. Present. Present. I'm in Pfizer Fund. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Judy Baum. Present. Present. Melissa Anderson. Neil Williamson. Present. Present. Nurev Patel. Present. Philip Johnson. Present. Rodney Reed. I'm present. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Rod Reed. 
Melissa Anderson is here. Okay. Candy Nygaard. Present. Sharon McDonough. I'm present. Sean Bowker. Present. present. Sarah Johnson. Present. Vicki Bennett. Present. I count 20, we have quorum. All right, thank you everyone. All right, so just to make everyone aware, the meeting is being recorded. Everything that is said in the meeting or displayed on video, if you're connected virtually, is part of the meeting minutes and will be uh, live on the YouTube video. So just keep that in mind. Uh, when not speaking, please uh, keep your microphone or telephone on mute. If you're attending only by telephone, press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, Shelly and Julia will be monitoring the chat box for any questions and for everyone's benefit, especially with the hybrid format, please make sure to identify yourself before remarks so we know uh, who is participating. Uh, the attendance report is attached uh, in the um, meeting packet from today. Uh, just a reminder that if you have uh, missed two consecutive meetings, you will be uh, contacted by the Bureau to determine uh, if you'd like to continue to participate on the committee. Uh, vacancy report. There are currently no uh, vacancies at this time. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome two new members today. Uh, first is Dr. Griffey. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. Excellent. And uh, Chris Deshant as well. Uh, our apologies. I know some of these uh, appointees were a little bit late and people may not have been able to arrange your schedule to participate. I just wanted to mention, I know I have been sharing uh, at the last several rounds of meeting about the Naloxo leave behind. Uh, if we can just click on that link there. Uh, this is really a big focus that we're trying to bring attention to uh, across the state uh, with kind of national data as well as Arizona data with the COVID uh, epidemic and pandemic. We've noted that there's been an increase in uh, opioid overdoses and really trying to help facilitate what we can do from the EMS perspective. Uh, we uh, do have the Naloxone Leave Behind program, and we've tried to make this as simple as possible for EMS agencies who would like to implement. So if you go to the main bureau webpage, there is a link uh, for Naloxone. Uh, it's near the bottom, one of the big boxes. And when you click on that link, it will then take you into all the resources that have been put together. So the Education Committee uh, very kindly has put together a nice training curriculum that you can use with your agency. Uh, we also have a copy of the standing order if you are a BLS agency and do not have medical direction for naloxone. Uh, we have the uh, a sample policy as well as an educational pamphlet that can be given to patients. And we've included the link to the uh, Office of Injury uh, Prevention, which is part of ADHS. Uh, they do have a resource for free naloxone. And so that is where any agencies can go if they wanted to order naloxone to participate in this program. So we'll just continue to highlight this. Uh, and please, if you have any questions, you can contact me directly uh, or contact Shelly and she can forward those questions to me. Uh, but we wanna make sure that everyone in the state is aware aware that this is a program that can be implemented in your jurisdiction. Next up is the uh, proposed uh, meeting schedule for 2022. I uh, just wanted to make sure if anyone sees any conflicts, uh, please let us know as soon as possible. Uh, we unfortunately had a conflict today for one of the religious holidays that uh, no one was aware of until uh, pretty recently. So uh, please make sure if you do notice any uh, other conflicts for 2022, we still have time that we can adjust that schedule. Again, you can let myself or Shelly uh, know that that needs to get changed. Next uh, for my report is there is a survey for public comment. Uh, this is regarding the uh, draft version three for the NISEMSO, which is the National Association of State EMS Officials uh, Model EMS Clinical Guidelines. Uh, we have used these to uh, do both our first and second version of the TTTGs or T3Gs for the state, so the state treatment guidelines. Uh, so just uh, wanted to make sure we shared that survey link. Uh, anyone is able to provide public comment and input into uh, the draft Model 3 EMS clinical guidelines. So I wanted to make sure that went out to everyone. Uh, next, I will go ahead and pass it over to Chief Garcia for the Bureau report. Good morning. Uh, this is Rachel Garcia with the Bureau of EMS and Trauma System. And I wanted to start this morning with our report by acknowledging that September is Suicide Prevention Month. And also with the 20 year anniversary of 
we think it's very important to stop and just take a moment to reflect and really think about the health and safety of our healthcare workers that continue to serve on the front lines as well as our, our first responders. In recent months, the department has launched a Start a Conversation campaign that really is intended to highlight the importance of um, social connection on physical and mental health. There's some resources available on the ADHS website at azdhs.gov slash start a conversation. And we would encourage providers um, and employers to, to look at the resources that are now available online. At the national level, we're hearing there are studies tracking increases in violence against providers and as well as EMS fatigue at this point. This is not surprising and the Bureau is committed to continuing to update our website with more of the resiliency resources we've shared in recent years. We're also going to keep updates on our COVID-19 resources for EMS and 911, um, another way to promote um, responder health and safety of the, at this time, of course. We've received funding most recently that we're going to be able to hire a full-time position in the next two years to be able to focus more on resiliency efforts. And so we just want to commit to you all that, um, that moving forward, this is going to be a big push from the department. And we look forward to working with the committees on, on some of these efforts. I have a few federal and state COVID-19 updates to share. I, I know you all are aware that hospital capacity remains a major concern for us at this time, and we continue to compete against other states for staffing resources. We have received a, a federal strike team that is going to deploy, if they haven't already, to the northwestern part of the state to support the hospitals in that area. The state level um, emergency declaration also remains intact along with the surge line at this point in time. The surge line continues to facilitate transfers for COVID-19 patients only. And they've also received $60 million to work on a staffing initiative to continue to support our hospitals. At this point in time, they've been able to secure about 250 nurses that are going to be deployed by the end of this month um, to hospitals across the state. Although the resources are limited, we're really fortunate that at this time, all the facilities that have submitted applications to that surge line staffing initiative are going to be allocated resources. And we're very hopeful that we'll be able to procure some more nursing staff as, as time goes on. Um, the Bureau continues to partner with ACS, as you all know, on inspections for level one and level two trauma centers. We also want to thank the, the reviewers that are participating in level three and level four inspections. We're always looking for surgeons to assist us with those inspections, and we just want to emphasize the importance that, you know, we need state reviewers to be able to continue those inspections for level threes and fours. We're asking if there are any barriers that any of the, um, the board members are aware of to participation in, in state reviews, please let us know. We'd like to continue to work on, on recruiting and training more folks to participate. A note from our annual STAB report um, that I'd like to highlight is that we have over the last um, 18 months had two trauma centers relinquish their trauma center designation with the state. We want to keep an eye on this and especially make sure that we're understanding how the, the pandemic has, and staffing shortages have impacted, especially our rural trauma centers. We want to make sure that we're also providing technical assistance to any of the facilities that might need some additional support during this time. Finally, I have some scope of practice and rule updates. I'm sure that everyone is aware that most recently we've updated EMCT scope of practice effective August 9th. This is now um, aligning our scope with national standards based on recommendations from the Medical Direction Commission. We also continue with air and ground ambulance rulemaking. The ground ambulance rulemaking process is still in the informal stage. The department is still holding informal meetings and soliciting input from stakeholders. We have a survey open to solicit um, some feedback on the most recent draft of ground ambulance rules that was posted in August. I believe that survey will be open until September 26th. We also have our air ambulance um, draft that has gone forward. That rulemaking is now in the formal process. We want to encourage anybody that would like to participate in providing feedback on the air ambulance draft rules to check out either the department's website or the register for the notice of proposed rulemaking. 
and that will provide information on how you can formally submit feedback on the air ambulance rules. I think that that covers most of it. Um, before I turn it over to Julia to introduce some of our new staff members, what I'll share is that there is a survey that we're also trying to collect a little bit more input on a definition for critical care services. We want to make sure that we are engaging staff and asking if there's any input that the board members would like to provide on a definition for critical care services that would include any staffing or training requirements. This is a definition that likely will be included in the ground ambulance rules and is also a definition that we can continue to build on as we think about critical care certification or education needs moving forward. So there will be a survey open, I believe until tomorrow. Um, and with that, Julia, I will turn it over to you if you can introduce our newest team members. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I am excited to announce that we do have a new EMS for Children coordinator, Adam Rodriguez. He um, has many years of field EMS experience um, and comes to us from Tucson, so we are very excited to have him on board. Um, he'll be transitioning to overseeing cases and working on our EMS for Children initiatives. And then we also would like to um, welcome Marissa Salgado as our new base hospital compliance administrator. So she will be fulfilling those responsibilities moving forward. So we, and we are so um, thankful to have both of these new team members on our team. Thank you, Julia. Uh, next, I'm gonna hand it over to Travis Connors, who is also a newer uh, member to the Bureau, I think new since our last uh, round of meetings with everyone. And he's gonna talk about kind of the pilot project application process and checklist. So I'm gonna hand it over to Travis. Good morning, everyone. So the notes here. So the goal was to develop an application that allows entities or individuals to submit a pilot study proposal proposal to the Bureau of EMS and Trauma for review in order to be considered for approval. Additionally, as part of the review process, the Bureau would utilize the Medical Direction Commission, MDC, as an advisory body to provide guidance to the director in making a decision. Within 180 days after receiving the proposal, the department director shall send a written notification of approval or denial of the proposed pilot study to the individual or entity making the request. If approved, the individual or entity must evaluate the pilot study and provide written reports to the department director. This application that is now created allows entities or individuals to formally submit a standardized and uniform pilot study proposal application to the Bureau for review in order for consideration for approval. So the purpose was to have the department authorize a testing, evaluation, and medical treatment procedure, technique, practice, medication, or piece of equipment for possible use by EMCT or an emergency service provider pursuant to AAC R925503 and ARS 362205. So furthermore, the Bureau has created a pilot study application checklist that will summarize the type of information and documentation required for an entity or individual to submit a pilot study application for consideration to be approved. This checklist will be available to the public on our EMS and trauma webpage. The location of the pilot study application and checklist will be on our Bureau's homepage. Clicking on the EMS Council MDC and STAB tile on that homepage, you then follow the Medical Direction Commission tab underneath that. Underneath the online membership application for MDC in bullet points, there will be the pilot study application as well as the checklist. And we highly encourage anyone who would like to submit a pilot study to review the checklist to ensure you have all the necessary information and documentation required to submit the pilot study application, a valid application. For all further inquiries or to receive more information related to the pilot study application, please email EMS pilot projects at azdhs.gov. Again, it's all one word, EMS pilot projects at azdhs.gov. Thank you. Thank you very much, Travis. Uh, next, I'm gonna hand it over to Vatsal, who's gonna present some uh, data from trends that we've noted regarding both out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and opioids. 
Good morning, everyone. Kalia, oh, thank you. Right. So we have now data till month of August for 2021. And uh, September, only 15 days, so I have not added 2021 over here. So what we see is that there are cardiac arrest incidents like in July compared to the last year, a little bit increased, but then, then there was again a big jump in cardiac arrest in the month of August. Um, if you look at the cardiac arrest percent, um, the same thing, but a bit increase in August and same is the rate. We can go to the next page. Next, okay. Position. All right, thank you. So the death-wise, I mean, I don't see much. July there was some fluctuation, then you know it went a little bit down again, it 65%, 64% death rate. So kind of um, th there is not much significantly different things happening between the last year and this year. So August, we can go to patient transported. Number of patients transferred, and as we see the last two years, you know, it, it is it's very it's decreasing compared to the 2018 what we saw in 2019 what we saw the number of patients were transported. And for every month, you know, that is decreasing, and the trend is still continuing. You know, less number of patients are transported to the hospital. Opioid. Thank you. Opioid cases are uh, suspected opioid these are you know it's are on the rise july august month a little bit increase in the cases go to the next page and death yeah so july we saw a very you know, um, almost double the number of deaths and then again in august we have the same thing has continued, then the number of the mortality is increasing. So if we look at the death numbers in July, we had total 80 deaths and then in 2020 and then, yeah, six, sorry, so it's, yeah, marginal difference in the August then, not the double, the even double, but it's a marginal difference between the two, two years. That's about it. That is Thank you, Vatsal. Are, are there any questions regarding uh, any of the data that she has presented? I think definitely something we started to notice a trend on uh, as COVID started increasing last year, and we've been closely monitoring that month over month, uh, just looking at comparisons of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and opioid-related uh, issues. And so one of the reasons why we did want to push forward has some emphasis on the naloxone leave behind program and really we'll start looking forward in the next year to kind of putting some renewed effort into kind of management and that awareness of out of hospital cardiac arrest. So thank you for presenting that data. I just want to make sure any questions before we move on on the agenda. All right. Uh, next up, I will hand it over to Sean for the trauma and EMS performance improvement standing committee or TEPI report. Sean, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. The uh, TEPI meeting was on July 15th, and um, we discussed and uh, approved the minutes as presented. The standing item that we discussed was the discretionary reports, and Dr. Gaither uh, mentioned uh, removing items seven and two, this was not a, an item we voted on. However, he had good points in that unless we were going to do research projects, the items were probably not useful. We also discussed the Nemesis 3.5 timeline uh, and Vosbrink shared that the vendors are testing with Nemesis currently the tentative data to open up AZ peers to allow 3.5 submissions is end of 2021. NEMSIS deadline to shut off 3.4 is December 31st of 2022. And Dr. Bradley emphasized that 2022 would be a time of transition for the January 
2023 NEMSIS deadline. Ms. Bosbrink welcomed any questions from agencies and hospitals regarding the NEMSIS uh, transition and uh, timeline. We also discussed trauma center designation um, and the timing with agencies that are uh, specifically applying for a different level with the state than their ACS designation. And uh, I can attest personally to the fact that the state has been working diligently with hospitals to accomplish uh, synchronized timing for uh, designation. If you applied with the state for a different designation and ACS did their extension of the timeline for a year, it would put you off sync with timing for verification and designation. And so the, the Bureau has worked really hard to try and help us stay in sync with those two. We also discussed the timeline for EMS annual report and STAB report and any special considerations for trend analysis when reviewing the 2020 data. Chief Garcia discussed ideas to incorporate for annual report generation to better understand raw counts and percentages and to help understand the data review with the changes in healthcare and impacts to the workforce that occurred uh, during the pandemic. Dr. Gaither suggested a COVID overlay on each graph to better display impacts. And I noticed in the draft report that uh, a COVID overlay has been provided. And we also discussed um, additional impacts on data, including increased population counts and the addition of the Phoenix fire data. And uh, that's pretty much it for the TEPI report. Any questions? Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Next up is Sandy for education report. Yes, um, thank you. Um, as as uh, Dr. Bradley already has discussed, we worked on the uh, naloxone leap behind program and that is currently now on the on the website. The um, our discussion on action items, um, we approved the post test questions for the pediatric uh, tracheostomy management for EMS training. And uh, we also did approve um, the draft for the naloxone leap behind training. Uh, we also, just in, under discussion was the um, the care of the MCS uh, patient training, which is was known as the VAD training prior to that. Um, hold on, I'm so, I apologize. I'm working from um, a remote location, so I'm having a little difficulty here. We had um, there was uh, discussed. We had a brief presentation on applied resuscitation education and standardized uh, training. Uh, by Dr. Rice, and uh, she also gave information on this new program for CPR and ACLS training that's specific for pre-hospital providers. And um, we discussed the current requirements for pediatric certification hours for paramedic and EMT certification. And Dr. Bradley gave us some background on the topic uh, for the uh, certifica uh, certification cycles are kind of under strain because of COVID, uh, for COVID. Um, the requirement in Arizona is five CE hours for peat specific uh, topics and uh, Dr. Waldrich advocated for more than five hours. He also uh, shared the names um, that names has an annual pediatric conference um, that was recorded last last year and uh, maybe referral hospitals are able to partner for training and development. Well, uh, discussed considerations for additional training gaps, including development of uh, pediatric trauma triage assessment training. And uh, that topic was discussed, um, to, we discussed that together and Dr. Bradley reported the stakeholders um, have shared a challenge finding good training uh, for triaging pediatric preverbal trauma patients. Um, I, uh, I also shared that Chris Ramos from PCH had training that may be available. Um, and I believe did I think we also added um, or mentioned our uh, work group, our uh, work group for behavioral health. Oh no, that's a different committee. Sorry, get my committees mixed up. That's all I have to report. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. 
Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Did you guys hear that, Dr. Castamore? Yeah, I've got you now. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. thanks, Franco. All right, so for protocols, medications, and devices, uh, we had forum on our meeting of July 15th. We received our bureau report. Several of those items have already been mentioned. Uh, we received the data dashboard update from uh, uh, from Botsol during that meeting as well. Uh, we received a brief update regarding digital certification starting on July 1st. With regard to discussion and action items, um, the uh, there was uh, a uh, motion to approve a work group to uh, uh, update and uh, edit uh, uh, the Table 2 agents, which are eligible for administration during hazardous material incident. And that uh, that work group uh, subsequently met uh, uh, several weeks after uh, there was a uh, uh, an approval to add uh, TXA to Table 1, uh, the EMCT uh, drug, drug box. And uh, I believe that was added as an optional. Uh, and then following that, the uh, drug profile for TXA was also approved. And we also discussed the uh, updates and timelines for updating uh, the Arizona T3Gs based on the upcoming um, uh, version of the model EMS gu uh, guideline updates from NISEMSO. Um, again, the NISEMSO guidelines are open for uh, public um, comment uh, currently. Uh, and uh, let's see, there was a, a discussion and uh, approval to amend Table 1 for a limited drug box utilization during special circumstances such as uh, wildland, uh, tactical EMS, and other uh, austere environment uh, EMS deployments uh, with some wording uh, amended to, uh, um, uh, to accommodate those special circumstances. Yeah, and that's uh, that's about it for uh, PMD. Open for any questions. Thank you. Uh, next up is Kara for Trauma Managers Workgroup. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so our Trauma Program Manager Workgroup met last on Friday, June 25th. Um, part of our discussion in that meeting is that we discussed continuing um, to connect remotely on a quarterly basis for that meeting. Um, and what we decided that we'll do is following our meetings, a recording uh, link will be sent out to all of our members. So if they're unable to attend, they still can get the information that we discussed um, at our quarterly meeting. Um, we also discussed that the AZCRH um, under our current FLEX program has provided uh, membership to the Arizona Trauma Association for all of our Arizona critical care access hospitals. Um, so that was wonderful that they were able to do that for those hospitals. And then we had an ex a very lengthy discussion of the ACS's um, modifications for their approach of verification of trauma centers. Um, so there was lots of discussion on that. Um, our next upcoming meeting is Thursday, October 14th at 11 a.m. Again, that will be held remotely. Um, we have a proposed agenda that will do some um, the new bureau staff introductions. Um, Vatsal will present um, the STAB annual report data. Um, and then we're going to do some discussion on insight on COVID related needs, issues, and barriers for a lot of our um, institutions in regards to trauma. And then leave it open for um, any other trauma program manager open discussion. And that's all for us. Excellent, thank you very much. And next, uh, Julia for PACES report. Good morning, everybody. Just a couple of updates from PACES. At the last meeting in July, we welcomed one new member, jo Dr. Joshua Zeidler. Members approved a set of post-test questions to accompany the tracheostomy training that was developed and approved earlier in the year. These are now posted on the BEMPS website along with the training PowerPoint slides. PACES also approved the development of two work groups, um, one for naloxone for pediatric patients and the other for be behavioral health. These work groups are ongoing and we hope to have items produced to present at the next PACES meeting in November. Lastly, I would just like to say that the EMS for Children program wrapped up na national data collection um, through the National Pediatric Readiness Assessment recently. And I would just like to thank everyone that participated in that. It was a lot of work. 
um, on hospitals parts to participate. I know it's a busy time, but thank you to everyone that participated in that. We really appreciate it. That's all. Thank you, Julia. Any questions regarding any of the uh, committee reports? All right. Uh, next for discussion, um, discussion and action items, uh, can I get a motion to approve the meeting minutes from our May 20th meeting, please? Thank you. I got a first. Second. Is, is, is there a second? Second. This is Sean. Thank you. Uh, hopefully everyone has had an opportunity to remove, uh, review those electronically. Are there any amendments needed to the meeting minutes? All right, hearing none. Hearing none. In the ease of doing an electronic vote, I will go with the nays first. So anyone opposed to the meeting minutes as displayed or uh, shared, please say nay. Hearing none, any hearing abstentions? None. All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Excellent, thank you. Meetings for minutes are approved. Uh, next up, can I get a motion to discuss, amend, and approve the 2021 annual staff report? So moved. Thank you. Can I get a second? Second. Got a second as well. Thank you. I believe the first was Caro, is that correct? Sean. So we didn't capture for the meeting minutes. If you can just say who uh, did the initial for, uh, motion to approve. Sean. Oh, Sean, thank you. So we can start scrolling through the uh, report if anyone would like to kind of stop at any specific page. I know uh, there's quite a bit to the report. Uh, I think there's really some interesting trends in here uh, that we did wanna make sure. I think everyone who's worked in a trauma center over 2020 noted a change in some trends, especially uh, kind of over the time frame where we had the initial uh, stay at home order. And so wanted to make sure that people looked at that for an awareness perspective. Hey, Dr. Bradley, this is Andy Tang. Will this report be available to the members? Sorry, Andy, yes, it will be. Sorry, I was just trying to make sure I handed someone an actual copy who's in the room with us. So yes, this is was available, I think, with the uh, meeting uh, invite, and we can also make sure it's shared electronically. It does need to be approved by STAB. Once this is approved by STAB, uh, this goes to the director and then it will be available on our website after that. Great, thank you. And Vatsal, I know you put a lot of work into this. If there's any specifics you wanted to point out here, uh, please feel free to share that as well. Sure. I think one trend we noted on page 17, if you look at the top, uh, the rise and fall injuries and also redu uh, reduction in motor vehicle crashes, um, it, you know, definitely goes along with the fact that there were less vehicles on the road. So we anticipate seeing that and probably more people at home 
Uh, so just one of the things that we did notice with that as a trend, I'm sure anyone has uh, noticed that in your facility as well. Maybe just kind of scroll through in some of the injury uh, patterns. If you look at the top of page 19, uh, the top six mechanisms of unintentional trauma, uh, I think you can see falls far outweigh uh, other injury patterns, so a significantly higher incident uh, with that. And then at the bottom of page 21, I always like to just point out that when we look at the state trauma database, it's interesting to compare that to Dave, which is the state uh, the statewide kind of death registry. Uh, obviously, any death that occurs out of hospital would not make it into uh, this, the trauma database because that's patients that actually make it to a trauma center. Uh, so I think it is useful to make sure that we kind of delineate that. Uh, anyone that is, you know, a fatality that does not get transported uh, would end up in Dave, which is a statewide death registry uh, as a comparison. Uh, so just kind of looking at those numbers there, uh, you do see a slight increase um, with immortality in both databases 2018 through 2020. Dr. Bradley, this is Sean. I have a comment. I uh, emailed Botzel earlier this week to request moving forward that with regard to Dave, we delineate the same uh, injury mechanisms as we do in the registry, if that's at all possible. Uh, we know that over 50% of people who die from trauma die before they ever reach a trauma center. And I think that having the information about what killed these people will really help the injury prevention folks at the trauma centers to better target our activities. So I think there were two people unmuted there to talk. Hey, Dr. Bradley, it's Vicki. Um, I just wanted to also call attention to the falls. I think this is great work that we've done here, and, and Botsell and her team have certainly put a lot of effort into it. Um, the inclusion criteria currently in our state, I think, underestimates the amount of falls because we do not collect all falls. Um, similar to, I know most are aware that our NTDB definitions as well as our state inclusion criteria. So I think we will appreciate a much higher level of falls if we can ever get to the point where we align that data set because it is much more pronounced. And I think uh, many of the trauma program managers and medical directors would agree with that in terms of the volume that we're seeing. Thank you, Vicki. And uh, just to clarify, uh, Sean, in regards to your question, was that about ask, requesting that we break down some of the trauma data from, from Dave? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that feedback. Uh, Shelly, I have a question on falls. Go ahead. Um, are these individual patients that they, they repeat it falls, or are they um, based on the just just um, random numbers or the of the um, EMS calls? I'm sorry, I we're having difficulty hearing your audio clearly. Can you just repeat the question? Um, these uh, falls, are they like repeated falls? Do we have that uh, information? Uh, in regards to the breakdown of, of type of fall, are you re referring to ground level fall versus fall from height? Is that the question? Uh, yeah, I'd say ground level falls because I know that there's um, there's a lot of uh, elderlies that do fall, but how many times have they fallen? And is that injured in as a into the stats or do they already, do they separate that? 
Vatsal, are you able to answer that question? I'm having a echo, so I'm not able to hear what he said. Can somebody repeat it for me? Vatsal, Vatsal I believe, I believe yeah. that um, he's asking whether or not we're able to track if the same individual has repeated, for example, same level falls. Um, so that is kind of a research questions. We are not tracking those right now. It is like we need to develop a program to find the duplicates within the registry to see if they have again come, the same person has come back, you know, with the same kind of an injury because every time the person comes back, it, get, it is entered in our currently, it, it gets entered in the registry as a new record. So you are we, we can do that. It's doable, um, but uh, we are not tracking it right now. Okay. So, and on our dashboard, actually, we do have a repeat falls, but it is not specifically to the same level falls. And we can, uh, so we can actually, you know, if if some if we are looking at same level fall, it's doable. We can do that. Thank you, Vatsal. Okay. We have a and, question and, here in the room. I'm just going to move my computer over. So. It's not working. <laughs> Here, you can speak into my computer there. Yeah, so I just um, want to say some of the things that we um, observed in this year's report. And I might be wrong on this, but the mortality for the severe brain injuries, GCS less than nine, uh, depicted on table 27 on page 32, is over 44%, which I believe is a lot higher than all the on, uh, all the past years. I think the past years, again, by memory, I might be wrong, is less than 40, like mid 30s, maybe 38, 34 in that range. So my question, it could be just an outlier, but since this was a COVID year and motor vehicle was really down, which that causes a lot of death. And now going to the page before, table 32, the mechanism of brain injury. Here, child and adult abuse ranks pretty high. Are the gunshots part of adult abuse? Because if the gunshots are part of it, that could explain the mortality. We had a surge in some gunshots over the COVID years. But if that's not part of it, then I wonder, is it just a, uh, you know, just an outlier or is there something brewing that we don't pick up yet? Thank you. Okay, so excellent questions. questions. Uh, Voxel, I don't know if you want to uh, address the first question regarding uh, are the is the mortality yeah. from TBI and GCS less than nine higher than prior years? I'm not sure if you have that data available. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Thanks, Voxel. Okay. Yeah. All right. So TBI, TBI GCS less than nine in that category mortality is 44 percent right now. What you see, and I have a last year report open up in front of me. And we have a mortality of 47% in the same category. So it's uh, so it has always been high. It's a GCS less than high, it's a less than nine. It's a very you know serious patients, and uh, like 1,358 patient had a TBI with GCS less than nine, and we can see there were 600 patient dead, which is 44. Last year we had 47% higher than the even this year. And your question is child and adult abuse. Yes, child and adult abuse. Can we go to the mechanism of injury, please?
Yes. So on uh, bottom of page 31, where do GSWs fall in the mechanisms? Does that fall under child slash adult abuse or would that be under a different category at that bottom? No. So we, this one child would one, I think it would come under firearm injuries. So they would be different than child and adult abuse. So the firearm injuries could be one of the cause over here, but it, it's not in the you know, main mechanism of injury. Make sense? So definitely two uh, trends that I think we need to look into and potentially do some more comparison uh, for follow-up reports is kind of looking at trends to see, are we seeing an increase in those incidents uh, over time? I think, you know, really the question is going to be where do our kind of volumes, both emergency department, EMS, and trauma volumes trend? I think anyone who's working clinically is seeing uh, potentially lower volumes, but higher acuity of patients and kind of how that affects what we see uh, both in the pre-hospital setting as well as in the emergency department and trauma setting as well. Uh, so definitely some trends that we can look at over time as well. Yeah, so the one interesting thing what we found is child, child and adult abuse became, you know, it had the highest like number of patients suffering from traumatic brain injury. Last year it was motor vehicle traffic accident. So that that was the only change we noticed. Um, can I just uh, say a couple of minutes on uh, on the report, Dr. Bradley? Do I have time? Yes, please. Yes, Thank you. Okay. Uh, I. What we have observed okay, the, uh, in the last year data is that our overall number of trauma patients decreased uh, than the last year, than the previous year. So 2019 data, and this is a 2020 data. So in 19, the number of trauma patients, the, the total N uh, was 58,600 something. And this year, uh, 2020, we had 58,000 uh, around 58,000 cases. So we had a little bit decrease in the number of trauma patients in spite of one trauma center increased last year. Um, that shows that, you know, number of traumatic injuries reported to the trauma center have gone down, you know, again, that kind of, maybe because of the COVID, less people were getting out on the road and staying home might have done that. But what we observed that, that even though the number of trauma cases decreased, what we saw is that the severity of those cases were higher compared to the 19, and the mortality it was higher. Uh, we also we saw many uh, different patterns than what we saw in 2019. Um, like we saw motor vehicle traffic accidents went down in 20, uh, 20, but again, the severity increased, even though the number decreased and the mortality increased. Uh, so some of the things we like firearm became the top six uh, it came into the top uh, top six mechanisms of injury which was not the case in 2019 um then total number of deaths which was uh, in 2019 we had 2.27 mortality and we we have now overall 2.5 percent mortality um alcohol and drug uh, what we observe is that a quarter of the patient, 25% of the patients uh, traumatic injury had either suspected or confirmed alcohol, whereas in 2019, 23%. So, we, you know, we, we are seeing some of the things, we observe these things and pattern. So what we decided is that, you know, that, you know let's work on these uh, trends, see it, you know, the difference between the two years and come up with an additional report uh, which you know we can dis where we can compare and see what are the difference between the two years we are getting it maybe the effect of pandemic you know or what is going on so we will be preparing a report pretty soon after this you know once the step report is done, uh, approved and done you know we, and you will be uh, comparing the two years and different trends and we will look into the ems side also we'll look into the trauma registry side also and the data database also as 
Sean Walker had a very good point, you know, that we need to look at the mechanism of injury. So I will be working on even that and we'll come up with an additional report. That's it. And Vatsal, I don't know if you wanted to speak about on page 34, where you did a really nice overlay kind of looking at trauma incidents and COVID incidents. Yes. That. Um, okay. So if you, I know it's a little hard because we, if we see those trauma incidents, yeah, if we can make a bit enlarge it. If you see when the, there is a wave of COVID is increasing, you know, we, we will see that the trauma cases are actually decreasing. So if, uh, can we go a little bit down? Yeah, so we can see both the lines and I wanna see the lower axis, yes. So in the month of June to July, if we see that there is a, there is a curve going up for the COVID incidents, whereas June to July, if we see it's kind of going down for the trauma incidents. Um, so the number of trauma cases are increasing. People are staying home, fear, whatever, and then the, as the COVID increases. So we saw, and that's a very cool pattern, we saw that, you know, as the cases increases, this is one is decreasing. Same thing happened in the, in the November, December, and January. And if you see the November, December, and January, it's kind of, again, started going down the number of trauma cases. But we will make a detailed report on these later. Thank you, Vatsal. I know this was a request from one of our uh, previous committees was to kind of look to see specifically, as we saw the increase in COVID numbers, how that affected our volume, both EMS and trauma. Uh, and I think definitely, uh, especially when you see the the effect kind of last uh, May into June, you see a significant drop kind of overlapping that. So a very useful trend to watch there. Yes, go ahead. So along the same chart, I just want to anyone pull data of just EMS calls? So if you jump into the see as well, like I know we had the initial big spike, right? Everyone saw significant drop in volume to the EDD. We're having some, we're running some of those calls as well. Just, just curious to see if that can be overlapped too. But it'd be another kind of interesting way to see the spray on systems from the hospital point of view, from the EMS point of view, from all aspects together. Yes, so a uh, great point in case anyone can't hear, uh, sorry, we're using a modified audio here. The question was, have we looked at the EMS uh, volume and trends related to the COVID uh, trends? Uh, and the answer is yes, that is would be, is gonna be under our EMS annual report that Vauxhall and her team put together as well. Uh, so definitely we are looking very closely at that specific as well. So. It looks very similar. Yes, <laughs> yes. So yeah, great, great question. Any further questions or comments? Uh, the question reflect the peak that we had up north in March. So uh, this is statewide data. Yeah, so this is data for the, the question was, is this Maricopa County specific or state specific? Uh, the data is uh, kind of statewide data, uh, but due to the volume for the entire state, uh, if there's small peaks in, uh, in different areas and jurisdictions, it may have smaller overall volumes. It may not be quite as apparent on the full statewide data. Oh, and also we sent out everybody that we had COVID wise. So I'm wondering if they showed up somewhere else. So that would be, if anything that's kind of COVID non-trauma related would fall under our EMS annual report. And so definitely, I think we'll see a lot more of those trends on that report. And to answer your question, I believe. In the orange. We were in the thousands in March. And so that should at least show a little blip there. And it goes, it goes daily, I believe, is the um, okay. the bars that you're yeah, seeing. Maybe when you do it by day, it doesn't show up much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. Any other questions or comments regarding the trauma report? All right, so All we, right, so we go ahead.
All right. I think, All right. I think we do have a motion on the uh, table to approve the uh, st annual staff report for 2020 uh, in the, making this more efficient electronically. Uh, anyone opposed to the staff report as presented, please say nay. All right, hearing none. Hearing none. Any abstentions? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Excellent. Thank you. A big thank you to Vatsal and her team. This is a lot of work annually to put together. And this year, uh, there was a lot of double checking she did when she was looking at the data just because there was some significant changes. So I really want to thank uh, Vatsal and her team for all the work that goes into producing the STAB report, uh, especially a STAB report that looks pretty different data-wise from previous years. So thank you, Vatsal. I'm going to hand it over next to Chief Garcia uh, just regarding an update about ACS verification and state verifications. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. Um, what I will add is that this, this STAB report now will go forward and be submitted to the director's office. The only addition that we intend to make is that we would like to um, add a 2020 snapshot infographic summary, and that would be to highlight some of the data points that we saw in the state trauma registry, as well as some of the comparisons perhaps that um, were seen in other surveillance databases, including hospital discharge database and then the deaf um, the death registry. So we'll um, we'll keep everyone posted, and this information will be available on our website, of course, along with the rest of our annual reports that are posted each year. On the um, ACS um, topic, I will share that we have been in close communication with ACS and um, Dr. Patel, especially. We have been talking with, of course, um, stakeholders as well about um, state inspection timeframes and some of the extensions um, that have been happening. As you all are aware, there are the one year COVID extensions and the postponement of site surveys by ACS um, that are currently in play through, is it 2023? Mm -hmm. And so in our state, we have a handful of facilities that actually fall into a category that are a bit unique in the fact that they are ACS verified at level two, but at the state level, in order to receive the, the trauma center funding, um, they are designated as a level one facility. And because of this unique designation, we want to make sure that we're continuing to inspect them on um, timeframes that will allow them to continue to maintain their designation as well as their state funding. And so what we've done is we've talked with Dr. Patel and submitted a request to ACS to be able to um, have ACS go forward in scheduling inspections within zero to 180 days of expiration for those particular facilities that are seeking redesignation. We would ask that those inspections are scheduled um, as soon as possible, of course, um, and that ACS would be able to align the verification dates with the state designation dates. We're hopeful that this can continue. ACS at this point, of course, is our preferred national verification organization, and we hope to be able to continue to partner with them on um, you know, keeping our facilities verified and designated within the state. I think that that covers most of what we've we've talked about so far. Um, I'll pause there. I know Dr. Patel is next on the agenda, and I'll just ask him if we missed anything with respect to some of those facilities that are unique in the fact that they are level one, level two facilities. Um, please let us know, and we're happy to clarify any questions that are, are still standing. Thank you. Are there Thank any you. questions for Chief Garcia? All right, I will hand it over to Dr. Patel for uh, ACS Committee on Trauma Report and then a brief uh, presentation regarding COVID-19 impact and learnings from a trauma perspective. Dr. Patel. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bradley. From an ACS uh, perspective, uh, really not much to add more than what uh, Chief Garcia has outlined. 
the request has been submitted uh, to the college and we hopefully should be having a response shortly. Uh, also from a COT perspective, the fall meeting will occur on October 20, 20th and 21st. And so if there are any updates that are pertinent, uh, we'll make sure that uh, those are shared back with STAB uh, at a future meeting. That's all I have with respect to the COT report, to barring any questions. Okay, uh, with respect to the COVID-19 impact, uh, Shelly, can I share my screen? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Perfect. Bear, bear with me, folks. Let me know when. We can see your screen. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Thanks, folks. Um, this <laughs> very timely that a lot of what uh, Botswell presented uh, is a, a lot of what uh, I will try to cover today. And, and just up front, the, this is our observations and opportunities. Uh, they're reflective of my own. Uh, they do not represent any health system or the Committee on Trauma. Uh, and just for a very quick overview, and we'll move through this pretty quickly because a lot of this was covered in earlier parts of the meeting. Uh, we'll talk about the trends, the implications, strategies. Uh, I'm going to throw in there just real quick as it definitely does pertain to trauma is what really happens in the world of surgery is, as it pertains to elective emergent urgent uh, procedures. Uh, and then what around trauma, right? What are perceptions? Uh, a lot of these were my personal perceptions, one that I got off the multiple chat rooms, uh, you know, that were created and the beauty of social media and communication that has come out of the pandemic. Uh, what was the data, though? Once we started talking about perceptions, uh, what were then subsequent strategies we could maybe look at uh, that came about? And then, and then lastly, and, and which Botswana has covered a lot, what really are opportunities? And how can we really use this uh, pandemic to really start looking at trauma care? Uh, and what opportunities do we have that uh, we can take away and not repeat uh, certain errors and set ourselves up for any kind of future events uh, that come along? We do a lot for mass casualties. Uh, and this now is just giving us a different opportunity to address trauma care. Trends, uh, you've seen these slides, I'm not gonna, uh, delve much into this. We've had our peaks uh, and then from a very sobering statistics actually that came out of a news uh, media outlet today, uh, one in 500 U.S. residents have died due to COVID from the start of the pandemic. That is a staggering number. Uh, I went looking for validation of where that came from, but doing the math backwards, it's pretty close. Uh, and once you put it in one to 500, that really is a sobering statistics for us. When we look at our trends with respect to our surges uh, and what Butzel is trying to do is overlay COVID into trauma, this is kind of the same concept, right? And this is the beauty of all the data we get from the state. Um, a lot of us, our health systems use the state data and the dashboards to help us drive strategy. Um, and as expected, right, our resource utilization pretty much mirrored what we were seeing with respect to our surge peaks. What about implications? And we've talked about this a little. Uh, you know, we talked about an, exec an executive order that first came out of the pandemic, and that was more surrounding PPE. Uh, we had stay-at-home orders, business closures. We had elective uh, surgery uh, orders to stand down, and then we had a reopening, right? And that was phased. And then we've begun this journey of. Dr. Patel, we seem to have lost your audio. Sorry, folks, did I lose you? 
We can hear you again now. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. My earpiece died. Uh, uh, apologies. <laughs> back to the reopening that we talked about in terms of being phased and then the subsequent waves that we've seen. And so from that came these observations of what do we do for strategy, right? We, we significantly were challenged with capacity um, and then the associated resources that go with it. So a lot of our strategy, at least initially, uh, whether it was state-based, uh, facility, health system-based, was driven based on conservation. And all of that came from the executive order. Right. Uh, as a result of that also came the concept of triage, and that just wasn't for trauma. Uh, it factored into all of the triages coming in, especially the COVID uh, hotline, and we started using the concept of load leveling. Uh, we started looking at redeployment of how we took staff and resources from departments that we typically uh, were not used to uh, redeploying into a more intensive care uh, aspects into our surgical floors. Um, and then we had the, the ability to use the emergency authorization orders to minimize documentation, uh, to let practitioners cross borders and practice in states under their pre-existing licenses, all things that we really could not do uh, pre-pandemic. So it opened up a whole number of different options. It opens up capacity. It opened up resources. And if we look at the big picture, and bear with me, this is a really busy slide, but it's to give you a trend um, of what happened to elective surgery. And this starts back in January of 2019 and goes all the way through till uh, September of 2021, year to date. Uh, and if you look at our peaks, you can see that first dip that we see was a significant drop uh, in 2020 when we had our first. We saw a similar drop back in the fall and into the winter months. And so the strategies were effective as they pertain to elective surgery. Uh, once we had the executive order in place and, and we went away from doing elective surgeries that were not urgent or emergent, we definitely had an impact. Uh, and that definitely helped with resources and capacity. When we then look at the completion of cases for add-ons, and this information that I show you now is based on our health system at Banner Health uh, across the enterprise, we really did not see a significant dip as we did with elective surgery as it pertains to add-ons. And that was, I think, a very pertinent question I was asked earlier about what was the EMS volume impact on this? Uh, we talk about trauma-specific, uh, but from a urgent uh, slash emergent perspective, we actually did not see that significant drop. So that volume did sustain itself. And then if you notice, as we move away, uh, that volume actually exceeded what it was the year before in 2019. Um, so add-ons and, and emergent surgery really was not affected by the pandemic and it continued to use uh, resources that we had. So now we were caring for the pandemic patients as well as having to also care for the pre-existing business that was already there. So then from trauma, um, you know, we all had these perceptions uh, of what is going on with the pandemic and trauma. And a lot of this came from the first surge. And we all thought we were busier than we ever were. Our volumes were higher. Our acuity was higher. We were seeing more penetrating injuries. Uh, we were seeing more assaults now, maybe more domestic situations. Uh, we we're also potentially seeing more the mechanisms of injury also shifting to more use of alcohol and drugs, right? A lot of the stuff that Vatsal has alluded to. And these were perceptions on our part from being uh, feet on the ground and seeing what we was coming in every day. And it just wasn't here in Arizona. This was kind of nationally reflected on a lot of the chats. And so injury severity, we also thought was up. We thought we were putting more patients in the ICU. That was putting more stress on our systems because the ICUs were a very uh, tight resource for all of us during, during the surges. Uh, and like I said, the alcohol and drugs seemed to be a predominant theme for all of us. So a lot of folks started looking at this, right, nationally in terms of what was perception, what was reality. And these are just some Slide examples of some large trauma centers. Uh, this is from the largest to highest volume trauma center in the U.S. Uh, that really looked at what its overall trauma admission impact was, and it's exactly what Vossel showed. The surge went up and the trauma volumes went down. But what they did find is it recovered very quickly. Um, it did not take long for, for that to come straight back up uh, following the end of the surge. When they looked at 
total admissions in Dow just for blunt or penetrating. The blunts definitely went down, uh, again, reflective of the information and, and the data that the stab report is, is reflecting. And did I lose my screen, guys? Sorry. There we go. Uh, from a another big uh, healthcare system on the East Coast, kind of the same thing, but they saw something a little different. Their, their blood volume definitely went down, but their penetrating went up, uh, their gunshot wounds went up, uh, and their stab wounds, at least in the suburban areas, not urban, went up. So we had these different perception and trends across the country, but most of the data was not reflecting what we were perceiving on the ground. And, and what I'm gonna share with you for the next few slides, is, it's all blinded data, but it's a, a data set that comes from all the level one, level two trauma centers out of our healthcare system. And the arrows are there to basically reflect, uh, the red arrows at the bottom basically reflect uh, the end of 2019 and going into 2020. And then the, the second red arrow gets us into 2021 and you see the data from January through March. And the arrows on above are the overlay attempt at what we saw with the, with the surges when our surges uh, occurred. So very similar data to what we're seeing in the state. The, we saw the surge and our, our activations went down. When we looked at our highest level activation, we actually saw a blip upwards. Um, initially, we had a downtrend, but thereafter, we quickly saw a upslope in the in the highest level activation numbers we had. Now, surprisingly, come the second uh, surge that we had, which was the more predominant one, we saw a significant drop uh, when it came to the highest level activations, but that wasn't reflected by our total activations. When we looked at injury severity, it was all over the place, right? We at the first surge, we definitely saw a spike. Uh, with the second, we actually went down with injury severity, hence reflecting the same trend as highest level activations. We looked at ICU admissions. Uh, we initially saw an uptick with the first, and then a significant drop thereafter. But with the second, interestingly, we started seeing the reverse patterns. Uh, it was the opposite of exactly what we saw on the first. And now, if you look at our third, we're following what we saw with the first. So there's some kind of rhyme or reason here that drill downs are gonna help us start understanding what is really different uh, as it pertains to the trauma population and the surges we're going through. It's the same disease process. So what is really different? Uh, penetrating reflected the national trend. I could have sworn I saw more gunshot wounds and stab wounds uh, during the surges uh, than, I, than I normally see when, when I'm on call. Um, could have sworn by those numbers, but they're not being reflected. We're actually seeing a drop. Uh, in, in our penetrating numbers. We also thought that assault, uh, domestic situations were really on the rise with people now being uh, with the stay-at-home order, everyone's indoors, tensions are getting high. Uh, and we did see an initial uptick uh, with assaults uh, after the first surge. And we saw a little bit of one as well uh, during the second, but not as significant. So there seemed to be some pattern that, that we were seeing as it pertained to the stay-at-home order. What were the observations? Uh, and these are, again, just observations, right? And this is from one data set from a healthcare system. Uh, so we saw a slight increase, but nothing significant than higher than what we saw in 2019. Hence, looking at the trend and exactly what Botsil showed, look at 2019, look at 2020, look at where we are now with the most recent, we really were not surpassing numbers that we had pre-COVID, uh, though we were seeing some slight increases. Uh, we actually had a decrease in penetrating. Uh, we had an increase in the assaults and maybe a domestic component hadn't quite flushed that out to that degree to, to make that statement. We actually saw a decrease in ICU admissions. Uh, and so overall, when we started looking at the data, it very much was against the perceptions we had. It was very much against what was being shared on social media, uh, what was being put out there in the outlets. And it also was a different aspect that we were looking at strategically as we said, okay, from a trauma standpoint, how much do we need to up resource or how much can we down resource based on the pandemic and the ability then to share and redeploy resources that we currently have that are secured for trauma purposes. But I think the bottom line when looking at all of it, at all of it is, uh, I think trauma is, and you can fill in that blank, it's anything proof. Uh, I think we are immune to any of the other events that occur. Um, I think uh, it it is an essential service line that does not follow the routine trends. It has a unique skill set. So as we talk about resources, as we talk about capacity, and we talk about redeployment, 
um, there are very few that have the skill sets that can automatically be turned into trauma, especially at the higher level acuities, uh, and expect people to just be able to fill in. Uh, it's just not a service line that, that tends itself to that. Uh, we also saw a big shift, right? At the first surge, our whole focus was capacity, and we all, all the health systems, uh, took their capacity resources 125, 150% based on executive order. We brought in a tremendous amount of external resources from outside the state, things that the executive order allowed us to do. And part of the beauty with that was that the surges that occurred across our country came in waves, right? So what started on the East Coast, by the time that died down and it started coming up to us in the West, those resources from the East were, were available to help in the West. Our current surge, unfortunately, is totally different. It's kind of hitting us all, all across. So we don't have these resources now that we can translate, you know, from geographic area to area to help us maintain the capacity. So we're really in a situation now where it's really not about physical beds. It's not about physical resources. It's really about the skilled resource and whether we have that available to continue to care for, for these patients during the surge. And the, the other was data, right? Perceptions are very prevalent and social media makes it very easy to start taking perceptions, putting them out there and people starting to believe that that is reality. And I think that for us is a huge collaborative effort uh, and what Botsville has shown, uh, we have geographic variances in the state, as was brought out, right? The north, the northwest saw the surges much quicker than we did uh, in the Phoenix area, in the Pinal County area. But if we start putting all of these together, it's all going to get blended because the volumes are so different, right? Maricopa County is going to push the curve uh, across the board just because of population density. But I think this really gives us the opportunity for stakeholders, right? Those of us, at, whether the healthcare systems, independent facilities, who have committed resources to providing trauma care. Um, how do we use the, the resources we have with the state? You know, the excellent dashboards that we still use. Uh, you know, when we look at our big book of businesses, we look at resources and capacity. How do we really use this opportunity now for trauma uh, and really start uh, using the information and data we have with the state to, to really start developing strategy. Um, is it triage? Uh, for example, you know, we always say get the patient to the right level of care. That often means the easiest access is to the level one, level two trauma centers. And we do bypass some of our level threes that have some capacity. How do we start using data to say if we are in these kind of surges and we are trying to protect the ones and twos to the highest acuity, patients that they can care for, how do we start utilizing the threes with their resources? How do we use our fours? But how do we use data then to really say that this is safe care? We're not compromising care by saying, listen, you typically would go to a level two. Now, because there are no beds available, you're going to stay at a three. Um, I think we can safely do some of those, right? But let data drive that uh, and not perception. And then the last is prevention. I think this was brought up by a number of people. I think we're starting to see whole shift with the pandemic uh, on our typical mechanisms that we we typically see the top six as the stab report is, is showing is changing so how do we really start driving data uh, using data to drive prevention strategies uh, so we really start a so we're really able to start catering to what we the need is can we be near real time no it's very difficult to do any of this near real time but i think with the stab report I think with the healthcare systems or trauma centers looking at their own data, partnering with each other, partnering with the state using STAB, I think we have a golden opportunity to use our 2020, uh, 2021 search that is going on now to really start building strategies around trauma uh, and to see how through STAB and collaboration, uh, we can really set up a playbook basically that uh, allows us to really start looking at future events. Thanks, folks. Appreciate Cliff it. Jones. Nerve Cliff Jones, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Dr. Jones, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, no, that's great stuff. And I, I think this, you know, don't let a crisis go to waste. Um, this is, I think, a great opportunity that we have failed at the national level concerning uh, crisis events that people cannot get, you know, across borders. Uh, if you're a physician in New York, you can't work in New Jersey because you don't have a license and so forth. And 
this may be something in which that we can kind of uh, form some type of registry of people that are available to help with these surges and changes in volumes uh, and get national input to assist with this because we've kind of you know from i know from a north peak standpoint north peak trauma association we've kind of failed or we've kind of been unable to get across these state lines concerning some of these uh concerning some of these um uh a different skilled needs in different areas um so i don't know what we can do at the pack level concerning this but it may be something that again we can kind of um you know, trauma people involved with this of every component, and maybe something that we could parlay this at the national level to have some registry again to have some cross coverage capability of certain people. Hey, Cliff, um, this is Dave Natrika. Um, uh, I agree with you completely. Um, the um, uh, I, I think the solution, um, though, is even broader. Um, I think that we need to get to a point where um, where if you are a licensed physician, you are a licensed U.S. physician, not a licensed Arizona physician or a licensed New York physician. And I, I really think we've got to get away from there. There, your training is is accepted throughout the United States. Your licensing should be national. There's two parts of that. One is um, if you are Doctor Death, you should not be allowed to pick up and move to the next state. And kill some more people, um, and then the the other aspect of that is, you know, in a crisis like this, when we need to move resources around, you're licensed or you're not licensed. But I agree with you completely in in concept. So this is Gail. I, I unfortunately have to stop the conversation. Uh, we are at the end of time, and we do need to, for completion's sake, at least close out a couple action items on the meeting. So, a uh, really good conversation, and I think definitely we can. Uh, if you have anything specific for the Bureau, you can definitely email me at gail.bradley at azdhs.gov. Can I please get a motion uh, to table uh, items F and G uh, till the next meeting, please? I'll make the motion. This is second. Sam. All right, I heard a first and second. a second. All those in favor, please say second. aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Aye. Aye. Are there any agenda items to be considered to the next meeting? All right, call to the public. All right, summary of events is in your agenda. Uh, just to, again, another request. If you are a surgeon and interested in participating in uh, site surveys for level three and four trauma centers, uh, please contact my shell, myself, Noreen, uh, Shelley, and we will make sure we connect you with the right individual. Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn, please? So moved, Sandy. All right, the meeting, meeting is adjourned at 1030. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.